All right, hey, well, good morning. Welcome, RCC. It's good to see you all today, whether in the room or online with us. I want to invite you to stand. Happy New Year. We're going to praise the name of Jesus in this place. We want to invite you to sing along with us. RCC, go ahead and have a seat and happy new year. We are so glad that you're with us tonight. Who made it all the way through the new year? Oh, wow. Y'all are awesome. 
You know, give yourself, give yourself a hand. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. I did not. I did not. But my, my intention was there, but my, my body was not. Um, hey, we are so glad you're here. And if you're new with us, welcome. And there's a card in front of you, a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. And we would love for you to fill that out. On that same card, there's a place to request prayer. And we are a praying church here at RCC. We have, a, we have a ministry that prays right now in real time for our services. We pray throughout the week. And we would love an opportunity to be praying for you in whatever season you're walking through. We believe that there's power in prayer. And so write down how we could be praying for you. Turn it in the table area by the crosses on either side of the room. And we'll be praying for you throughout this week. And then awesome, or also church, we have an opportunity to continue towards giving what God is doing here through the ministries at RCC. We finished the year strong, and let's start this year strong as we step into 2023 to give towards what God is doing here. And your generosity, it's truly making a difference. If you've come prepared to give of an offering today, whether in the room or online, you can see that there's several ways on the screen that you can contribute towards that. And thank you so much uh, for doing that. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna turn our attention to communion this morning. And you know, worship, is more than just coming together and singing songs, right? Sometimes we think we're gonna come and we're gonna worship the Lord and we're gonna do that through singing, but really worship extends so much further than that. Worship is a position of our heart. It's a preparation of our mind and our soul. And when we prepare and we, when we spend that time in preparation towards the Lord, that in result manifests into an expression of praise, which we share as the church family, much like this weekend, this morning. And so, how are you preparing your heart in worship? It reminds me in this new year, right? We have this new year that we're stepping into. It reminds me of the new promise that God offers us through his son, the new covenant. I wanna read us a passage. As we start communion, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand if you didn't receive the elements and our ushers will, will bring those by to you as I read this passage. Just keep your hand raised and they'll bring those by for you. But 1 Corinthians says this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave it, or and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup, and after supper, he said, this is the cup. This is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's why we're here, right? That's why we celebrate. That's why we come and we, and we sing and we praise and we have hope because we have a Savior who came. He offered us a redeemed life through his death and his resurrection. And that in return, church, it gives us hope. When we take of communion, we are remembering of the sacrifice that the Lord paid for us. We're doing this in remembrance of his good work on our behalf. And so as we step into this new year, can I invite you to step into the promise of new life that Jesus offers to each and every one of you, regardless your season, regardless your circumstance, regardless of the hurt, the brokenness, the joy, whatever it is, the ups and the downs, God remains constant. He remains faithful and his promise remains true. And Jesus has provided a way for each and every one of us through his redemptive work. And we celebrate that, we recognize that through taking communion. I wanna invite you to consider that, give God the praise for his restorative work in your life as I pray, and then we're going to continue to sing. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your goodness, and Lord, we thank you for your church. God, we thank you for the fact that we can come together together as a body of believers, and we can sing and declare your goodness in our lives. God, we thank you for the fact that this is a place where we can come and bring our brokenness. God, we're not perfect. We're only made perfect through your redemptive work in us. You, Jesus, living in us is what reconciles us back to the Father. And so, God, help us not to dwell on our imperfections, but to celebrate the new life and the, and the perfect Savior living within us. God, that's what we celebrate. That's what we acknowledge. And that's what we declare here in this place today. And, God, we give you the praise and we give you the celebration. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing it again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, and you are here, man, I worship you, Lord, I worship you. Turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop come on church let's declare that this morning let's lift our voice sing that out even when i don't see it you're working
Father God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for the power of your truth in our lives. And God, we are here today, Lord, to declare that goodness in our lives, to declare that goodness in this town, in this city, in this nation, in this world. And God, we pray that our lives would be a reflection of your goodness in us towards others. God, we give you the praise. We give you the honor. We give you the celebration. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, church. Can we give God the praise? Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. And we want to welcome all those who are joining us online this morning. Happy New Year to you as well. And we're excited about amazing ministries that we have here at RCC. We want to let you know one, one ministry right now that's getting ready to launch. It's called CORE. And Lori's going to tell us a little bit about that right now. You guys give it up for Lori. She talks about CORE this morning with us. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, you know, a, a mission here at River Christian Church is we win people, we train believers, and we unleash disciples. Well, core is pretty much that last part of training believers and unleashing disciples. When I came to know the Lord, I was in my early 30s. And I know that was a little late, but better late than never. But when I became a new believer, I had no idea how to read the Bible. I wasn't even sure if I was even praying right. There were so many questions I had. But I was very fortunate that there was a pastor at the church where I came to know the Lord, Pastor Phil. He was the pastor of discipleship. And he took me under his wing. And in that process, he opened, when I opened up the scriptures, he would explain them. He would walk alongside with me during this journey. And he would encourage me, and he would also challenge me in ways, too, that really stretched me. But it was during those times as I became more intimate in knowing who Jesus is in my life, or knowing who he is and who I am in Christ, that I am a new creation. And what does that mean to be a new creation? But as I became more disciplined, more obedient, more faithful, more trust in Jesus, I then turned out to be a disciple of others, and I became a mentor to others. And so that's what CORE is. It's this process. It's the process of training believers and unleashing disciples. So whether you're wondering what Christianity is about, or maybe you're a new believer, maybe you're already, a, you've been a believer for a while, but yet you've never really had the opportunity to be under the leadership or the training of somebody, or maybe you are a very seasoned disciple and you just want to see somebody's eyes open when they understand who Jesus is. Core is for you. Well, we're going to begin next Sunday during the second service at 10 o'clock. So we'll be meeting from 10 to 11, and I invite you to come out and just find out what we're about. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, you're saying, ooh, that sounds like something I'm excited about or I want to know more about, we have a table out in the atrium, and myself and my team are out there. We would love to meet with you. Thank you so much. All right. Give it up for Lori. And, you know, what she's talking about is so pivotal because we want to win as many as possible, but obviously, how do you train them up? And that's part of what we do here at RCC is offer core to help those know what it is to be a disciple of Jesus, which obviously is about being unleashed to change the world and to win people to Jesus and then start that process all over someone else. And so we're excited about that. Another thing I'm excited about is, in our churches too is, is we want to help you do that in your home. Like how do I do that in my life as a parent or as a grandparent? How do I do that? And we're going to have an amazing opportunity to teach you how to train believers in your home through this Love and Leadership Parenting Conference that's taking place on February 26th and 27th. And and a guy named John Roseman, who is a hero of mine, is going to be here. I'm kind of like almost giddy about it, all right? I cannot believe John Roseman is going to be here because he, I, I read so many books on parenting. I used to teach classes on it. And so I, I, would, I would sit there and go, okay, who's the best, the best? And I'm going to tell you right now, the best I have ever found is John Roseman on how to be a disciple of Jesus and how to make disciples in our home and how to do that, especially in difficult situations like 
discipline issues, right? <laughs> How do I discipline my kid in a way that's going to be helpful and bring them up in the ways of the Lord? I'm telling you right now, it's going to be really practical. You will not regret doing it. In fact, it'll change your family and it'll change generations. So we're going to have that happening February 22nd and 26th, 27th, but registration opens today. And so you can go to riverchristian.church slash parenting and go ahead and register today for it. So it's going to happen on a Sunday afternoon mainly, and there'll be a Q&A that happens on that Monday, that Monday as well. So I want to encourage you to go ahead and register today for that. You know, we had our Christmas Eve services. We had five services starting on Thursday night, the 22nd, and four on Christmas Eve. And we had over 2,000 people show up. Isn't that awesome? 2,000 people show up for Christmas Eve services. And so praise God for that. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of things happen. We had a couple of, couple of young men who heard the message, and they went to their parents and said, you know what, we want to get baptized. And, uh, and their and parents said, when? They said, right now. <laughs> like, right now. And then, and then the parents were like, I'm not sure if you can do that. Let me tell you right now. You can that RCC, all right? You can always do that at RCC because that's what happened biblically. And so that's what we did, and we basically, we encouraged them to do that. They did. They were baptized. Isn't that awesome? They were baptized in between services on Christmas Eve. <clears throat> and then on top of that, here's what got even crazier. Somebody said, you know what? I'm going to use Christmas Eve services at RCC to propose to my girlfriend, and he did that right out the door right here in our atrium. I haven't told you what she said yet, though. I haven't told you the answer. She said yes. She said yes. Praise the Lord. All right. So uh, anyway, just exciting time and just, just praying for God to, to, to water what's been planted from our Christmas Eve services. So we're launching a series right now called Mission Possible, and it really is possible for you to be on mission for Jesus. And I want to I talk to you today of kind of the foundation of that. And today, uh, Jesus gives us foundation of it. When he says in John 13, these words right here, and I want you to read, especially the yellow part with me, by this, all people, all people, all people, people who don't even believe in Jesus will know that you're my disciples if you what? Read it with me, church. If you love one another. And friends, that's the heart of compassion because it is the heart of God. We really need to be compassionate people. People who have a heart of God, who have a heart built on Jesus, are always being compassionate people for the last 2,000 years. And we want to continue that. So this week, I'm going to tell you a story. It's going to be coming from the Old Testament. So you might want to go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you're, if you're having a hard time finding it, maybe in your Bible the pages are stuck, all right? It's been a while, maybe, since you've been in 2 Samuel chapter 9. But we're going to look at a man there by the name of David, and he's amazing compassion to a man named Mephibosheth. Everybody say Mephibosheth on the count of three. You ready? One, two, three, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Now, my thinking is, like, why would a mom name her son Mephibosheth? Like, what parent would do that? I just know if, if Mephibosheth were from the south, we would just call him Bo, all right? We just keep it simple. <laughs> we're going to Bo, all right? So the bottom line is Mephibosheth is an amazing story here about the heart of David. Because David, the Bible said, man after God's own heart. Because of all his power and all his success, no matter what happened with David, he continued to grow and be moved in the direction of compassion. Just like so many people here at RCC. So let me tell you, there are all kinds of spheres in our world that are not very compassionate right now, right? Politics, not very compassionate. Sports, we got college kids who are trying their best to win a football game, and you would think, you know, uh, these adults are, who are twice or three times their age are just reaming them over the coals. I mean, not very compassionate in that world. Business, um, and have you noticed how people are after COVID? I mean, it's like everybody walks around with hemorrhoids. I mean, people are just really... <laughs> like sour, like they're just angry people. And so right now, we as people of Jesus have a whole new opportunity to, to be light in this world that is so dark, amen? And, and that's going to shine brightest through our compassion. Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, be kind, be kind and what? And compassionate to one another. And man, church ought to be the one place you can go and expect 
switching here. We can expect to have compassion. If there's any place you should go on this planet where you should experience kindness, it's the church. Amen? So here's scripture right here. Psalms 112 describes a person who has a heart of compassion just like God. Look what it says in verse 4. Light shines in the darkness for the godly. Isn't that interesting that godly persons can always navigate, no matter how crazy it gets or hateful or fearful it gets out there, a godly person can always navigate because we know which way to go. Here it is, because they are generous and what? Compassionate and righteous. Family, the darker the world gets, the brighter, brighter the godly shine. And David was a great example of this. Let me kind of set this up as we dig into 2 Samuel chapter 9. David, before he was king, a guy named Saul was king. And David kind of rose up in the ranks because he was chosen by God, and he defeated a terrorist by the name of Goliath. Goliath was trying to kill every single Jew, every single Israelite out there. And David killed him. And so David rose up in prominence. He rose up in popularity. But the higher that David rose in popularity, the more paranoid Saul got. They always say paranoia will destroy you, right? And that's exactly what happened to Saul. And I will say this happened to a lot of people I know. Paranoia will destroy you. And that's what happened to Saul. And Saul's life just went down the tubes. He tried his best because he was so fearful of David that he actually killed David. And so David had to flee for his life. And even crazier than that, David's best friend was a guy named Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan is Saul's son. And so Jonathan knew that the anointing was on David and not on him. Now Saul wanted Jonathan to be king. But Jonathan and everyone knew that David was going to be the next king. And so what happens is Jonathan and his best friend David, they make a pact. They make a pact, they make a covenant, and they make a vow to one another. And here's what Jonathan says in 1 Samuel chapter 20. But, but should it please my father to do you harm, that's a poetic way of, way of saying my dad's trying to kill you. If I am still alive, show me the, the steadfast love of the Lord, David, that I may not die and do not cut off your steadfast love. Because you love me, David, do not cut off your stuff as love for my house forever. And when the Lord cuts off every, every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. See, Jonathan knew that his dad was a fool. And he knew his dad was leading the nation and the family in a deadly direction. And that's exactly what happened. Because of Saul's paranoia and his fearful attitude, he led his family and the entire nation down the tubes. And it led to a point where David and Jonathan's relationship ended because Jonathan died. David, Saul and, 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 and Jonathan were killed in battle. So hit fast forward again. God makes David king after a number of years. And under his leadership... Israel grew in prominence, it grew in power, and David's personal fame continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And it's in the midst of all that, in the midst of all that success and wealth, his heart of compassion shines out. And I'll just tell you this, that's unusual. Because oftentimes, the more successful we are, the more wealthy we are, the more fame we, are, we have, oftentimes, the less compassionate we get. But that's not what happened with David. So here's the thing about this whole story. Compassionate people, they give gifts. Just like the psalmist says that the godly, the godly are generous and compassionate and righteous. Now look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse, verse 1. It says this, and David said, hey, is there anyone, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him what? That I may show him what? Kindness for Jonathan's sake. He's remembering that covenant, that vow he made with his best friend when he was alive. David was remembering that promise, and back in the day when the king rose in prominence, rose in power, often what you would do is you'd purge every family member of the pre-existing dynasty. You would just kill them off, so that way there was no chance of a revolt. Israel had never known a king like David. That's what they expected David to do. They're like, he's going to kill off all of Saul's descendants. So what he did was so shocking and such a surprise because David was generous and compassionate and righteous towards Saul's family. But don't miss this. So often, the circumstances in which you make a promise are very different from the circumstances in which you need to keep that promise. Let me say it again because that was really good. All right, here we go. The circumstances, especially you married people, listen. The circumstances in which you make a promise 
are very, very different from the circumstances in which you need to keep that promise. Amen? Oh, yeah, I love the car. The car's brand new. It has no miles on it. I'll make those payments. <laughs> and then 60, 80,000 miles later, after some wear and tear, I'm not sure if I can make that payment on the 15th anymore. Oh, yeah, I, I love you, girl. I I'll care for you. I will protect you. I will marry you. You're the only one for me, baby. You can say that when you're sitting on cloud nine underneath a full moon or after a Christmas Eve service outside of an atrium. I don't know where you're going to do that at. But anyway, it's another thing to keep that promise 30 pounds later, <laughs> sitting on Asian furniture, staring at unpaid bills, dealing with crazy kids. Psalm 15, 4 says this, faithful followers of the Lord who keep their promises, guess what? Even when it, what? Hurts. That's what faithful fathers do. See, family, David kept his promise even though the circumstances had changed. He didn't have to do this. I mean, the guy he made the promise with is dead. And nobody is calling him out on that promise. He's not aware of any descendants. And years later, defining moment marks him as a compassionate leader. He goes out and he, he sends out a, a reminder and, and, and starts sending out a search because he's going to fulfill that promise. Look what it says in Scripture. He asks this question, is there still anyone left in the house of, of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And I want you to think for a moment, one step towards compassion is this, and this is a huge lesson that we learn. Compassionate people keep their word. Compassionate people keep their word. They, when they say they're going to call you, they'll call you. When they say that, you know what, uh, uh, we'll, we'll visit, they're going to visit. They're going to follow through. When they, when they say they're going to show up, at, I'll be there at noon, they're going to be there at noon. I mean, there are people who, who when they say they're going to pray for you, they're going to pray for you. I, I think about people who uh, uh, will say, hey, pastor, will you pray about this? And a week goes by, and then I see them, and they go, hey, pastor, thank you so much for praying about that. Guy came through in a big way. And I'm like, praise the Lord. But inside I'm going, oh, I forgot to pray. You ever done that? And so what I've done now, what I've started doing is I'll tell people, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. Like, we just pray right then and there. And sometimes it's awkward because it could be in a bathroom. I mean, it could be anywhere. I'm like, I grab my hand. Let's, let's pray right now in front of Walmart, right here in this restaurant. Oh, Charlie's, let's pray right here, right now, because I want to keep my word because that's what compassion people do. If you decide to serve in a ministry here at RCC, show up. Be on time. Don't call out of the children's ministry the night before because you got a better offer. <laughs> That's not compassion. David kept his word. And he started doing some research to keep that word. He called a former servant named Simba over. And he said, hey, is there any grandson of Saul left? Look what Simba answered the king. He said, oh, yeah, there's still a son of Jonathan, you know, your best friend. He is crippled. Look at this. He is crippled in both feet. Now, what happened in 2 Samuel, starting in verse 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 4, what we see is all of a sudden there's news that comes out that Saul and Jonathan have been killed in the palace. And so the palace just goes in a panic. They start grabbing kids, and they get out of there because they think they're coming for them. And they grab a little Mephibosheth, who's five years old, and they grab him, and he's being dragged down the stairs. And as he's being dragged down the stairs, his ankles, his little feet are just banging against those stairs, and they break. And it never gets set. And so for the rest of Mephibosheth's life, he is crippled. He hobbles. Or he walks on crutches. All because of what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. And I think that what, what uh, Mephibosheth, I mean, what Zimba's doing, he's saying, you know what? I mean, he's got a disability, so you don't have to worry about him. It really doesn't matter that much. But David, notice how David responds. It doesn't matter about his disability David doesn't say, okay, uh, what does he look like? Or, you know, how bad is he? He just says, look what Scripture says. It says, he just says, where is he? Where is he? David is going to do a clinic on compassion. Because here's what we learn from David. We learn to love unconditionally. It doesn't matter that he's disabled. You know why? Because grace is a gift. You can't earn it. Grace is not reciprocal. Oh, yeah, I'll do this for you, and you do this for me. That's not how grace works. Grace is totally undeserved. Unconditional love just looks for opportunities to express itself, even to people who may not be deserving of it. So David asked, 
Where is he? Look what happens next. Zimba says, well, he's in the house of Makur, son of Amiel in Lodabar. Now, if you're in a place called Lodabar, that's not a good sign. Maybe hide the bar or raise the bar, <laughs> but not low the bar. Low means no, the bar means pasture. So the place means no pasture. It is a desolate, desolate place place. It's outside Gilead. And basically what do, what's happening here is Mephibosheth has been hiding, hoping that nobody would come look for him since he's five years old. He's out like way past the boonies, as we'd say. Now, we don't know how old Mephibosheth is, but we know he's got a 12-year-old named Makah. We see that in verse 12. Or actually, he's got a son named Makah. But then Mephibosheth is probably thinking, you know, David is going to purge the entire Saul family off the face of the planet. He's a grandson of Saul, and he's scared to death, and he's living in fear that he's going to be killed as a crippled man. But look what happens next, verse 5. Then King David sent and brought him, brought him from Lodabar. Now, can you imagine Mephibosheth? He's been hiding out for years, and all of a sudden he hears a, a knock at the door, and it's a soldier. And the soldier says, King David wants you right now back in Jerusalem. Where do you think Mephibosheth is feeling? He's scared out of his living mind. He's so fearful. He's scared to death. Look at verse 6. And Mephibosheth, the son, of, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face. I bet he did. And paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. Think of the last time Mephibosheth was in that palace. The last time he was in that palace, it was panic. It was chaos. He just found out his dad, his granddad were killed. And all of a sudden, all that fear came into a painful experience as his legs, his feet, his ankles were broken. Can you imagine walking in that palace for the next time, for the first time since all that happened? And now he thinks he's going to die. I mean, his stress level, the tension inside of his own soul has to be terrible. He doesn't know what to expect from David, but he knows this. He knows this. He knows his granddaddy tried to kill David. Any chance he had, he tried to kill David. He knows that. He's expecting the worst. Look what happens in verse 7. David says to him, read it with me, church, do not fear. I love that. <laughs> he knows he's scared. David says, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, my best friend, Jonathan. Can you imagine how emotional this must have been for David? And I will restore to you all the land of your, of your father Saul, and you shall eat at my table. How often, church? You shall eat at my table. How often? Always. What? Mephibosheth thought he was going to be killed. He was going to be executed. Now he's getting adopted. He's going to live in the king's palace. He's going to eat at the king's table. He's going to inherit the entire estate of the previous king, his grandfather, Saul. And what did he do to deserve this? What's the answer? Nothing. Nothing. What's David showing? Compassion. Compassion is amazing grace. Grace is is giving something to someone who doesn't earn it and cannot repay it. And that's why this is such a defining moment of King David. Here he is with all this power and all this wealth, and he's stooping down to helping somebody else from the world's perspective is the opposite. Scripture says this in verse 8, And he paid homage, Mephibosheth did, and said to him, What is your servant? What is your servant that you should regard, show regard for a dead dog such as I? That term dead dog means of like a person of low esteem. We would say something like this, like, dude, I'm the scum of the earth. Why in the world would you do this for me? And it's so interesting here because we call this amazing grace. Look what happens in verse 9. Then the king calls Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belonged to Saul. And to all his house I have given to your master's grandson, Mephibosheth. And you, Ziba, and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have, have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth 
Your master's grandson, grandson shall, look at this, always eat at my table. Now, now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So think for just a moment here. Mephibosheth hobbled in there with nothing. I mean, he had nothing. Five minutes later, including Ziba, he's got 36 servants to take care of him. A whole entire royal estate that used to belong to his grandfather. And David didn't have to do any of it. Talking about generous, talking about compassion, talking about righteous. This is amazing. See, compassionate people, they give undeserved gifts, especially followers of Jesus, because we have received undeserved gifts. And here's another thing about compassionate people is they take risks. They are risk takers. Later on, David is having to leave Jerusalem because his son Absalom is taking over. And so in the midst of all that, he stops in all the chaos of having to leave because your son is trying to kill you. I mean, imagine that, that drama, that tension, that distraction. In the midst of all that stress, that family drama, he is mindful of Mephibosheth. And look what happens. He stops and, and he's thinking about Mephibosheth and, 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 and he finds out, he asks Ziba, like, what, what's going on with Mephibosheth? And, and Ziba says this, oh, Mephibosheth, he's staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today the house of Israel will give me back my grandfather's kingdom. Wow. David's like, what? After all I've done for him? He's hoping that me and my son will kill each other off and, and everybody's going to make him king? Really? I mean, David had to be crushed that Mephibosheth could be so ungrateful after all the compassion that he has shown him. But you know, church, you can give and you can give and you can give, but for some people, instead of them being grateful, they end up like being more entitled. And they go, well, what have you done for me lately? What have you done for, for, for me you know, today? They get really critical of you. Or the first time you show them tough love, they stab you in the back. And man, when David heard this, he gave everything to Mephibosheth. He then switched it and then gave it to Ziba. And when David's army defeated Absalom, he returned back to his palace. And David is hurting because his best friend just killed his son. But when he got back to the palace, he had the shock of his life. There's Mephibosheth standing on the doorway of the palace welcoming King David. And look what happens. Verse, uh, verse 25 of chapter 19. When he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, and I could just see King David just kind of with his arms crossed, just really defensive, looking at Mephibosheth and saying this, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And look at what Mephibosheth says. He says, my lord, O king, my servant, he's talking about Ziba, my servant deceived me, for your servant said to him, I will sell a donkey for myself that I may ride out on it and go with the king. For your servant, reminder king, I am lame. What's he saying? Ziba left me. Ziba threw me under the bus. I was waiting on him. He took off without me, and I had to stay. And then he says this about Ziba. He says, he has slandered your servant to my lord the king. My lord the king is like, he says this about David. You are an angel of God. Do therefore whatever seems good to you. Most scholars believe that Ziba lied about Mephibosheth. But I just want you to think for a moment, all that David has had to deal with, his own family drama, his family drama is out there, all the dirty laundry for everyone to talk about for all time. His sons tried to kill him. It divided, it caused a civil war. Now he's having to come back home after his son has been killed. He's not in a good place. And now he's got Mephibosheth saying that Ziba lied and Ziba saying that Mephibosheth lied and everything's out on the carpet. And you know exactly what he's thinking. Many of you thought the same thing during Christmas. I don't have bandwidth for this family drama. I've already got enough going on during Christmas. I got enough going on during this happy new year, right? I don't need to deal with this. And you can just tell, like, he's just so overwhelmed by what's going on. He's saying, I don't need this. But Mephibosheth, you know what he's thinking? He's thinking how hurt David must have been after he has bestowed so much graciousness on, on Mephibosheth. And he thinks that Mephibosheth's ungrateful. So what he does, Mephibosheth does, he just throws himself at the king. 
He says, whatever you think is best. And David's had enough. He's just done. He just says, Ziba, you have one half, and Mephibosheth, you have the other half. Now, if I'm Mephibosheth, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sharing with that guy. He lied. That didn't happen. He threw me on the bus. But Mephibosheth is very humble. Look at this incredible response, what he says in verse 30. Mephibosheth says, says to King David about Ziba, let him, say it with me, church, let him what? Take it all. Let him have it all. Since my Lord, the king, has come safely home. You know, I love this about David. David had to take the risk of facing some complexity because he was so compassionate. And a lot of people are not willing to do that, right? Because it gets messy being compassionate. And sometimes I don't have that feel-good feeling. And I'm only going to do it when I feel good about it. That's not compassion. Compassion is willing to get in the mess. That's the risk that compassion is willing to take. Why? David showed compassion to an undeserving Mephibosheth because God showed compassion to an undeserving shepherd boy and elevated him to be king of Israel. He was aware of how God has been compassionate to him. Mark Twain said this, kindness is the language the deaf can hear and the blind can read. So here you go. Compassionate people, guess what church? They take action. Compassion people take action. The Greek word for compassion means spagnizomai, which means not only do I feel it, I feel compassion, but I feel it so strongly, I've got to do something about it. Compassion is more than feelings. Compassion is more than words. See, David made a vow to Jonathan, but making that vow was not compassion. Fulfilling the vow was compassion. Not making the vow. It's easy to tell someone, yeah, I'll be married to you. It's a whole other thing when the going gets tough and you stay loyal to that vow. That's compassion. Fulfilling the vow is compassion. Compassion isn't just making a promise. It's actually putting hands and feet to it. It's actually about action. I love what James says when he says these words. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, hey, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what, church, read it with me, is dead. Family compassion requires action. It writes the note. It makes the meal it takes the visit. I, I think about my son. I've got a son named Ryland. He's very compassionate. He gets that from his mama. All right, because he didn't get it from me. I got to work in this. And we've been playing soccer. My son's usually, if he's not the best player on the field, he's usually one of the top guys on the field. And so he'll have the ball and he's moving. And, and, and Ryland's just getting faster, gets getting stronger and getting bigger. And soccer can be kind of brutal. You know, you can bump into one another. And all of a sudden he's running, he's got the ball. And then all of a sudden, like, somebody bumps into him and they fall over. And I'm like, yes, keep going. But you know what my son does? I'm not kidding. Every time it drives me crazy. He immediately passes the ball. He doesn't have to. And he turns around and he helps the person up. I'm like, son, what's wrong with you? We're trying to win the game. See, compassion takes action when it's inconvenient. When it's not about you. And it's not about your goals and your agenda and your schedule. Compassion always stops and makes it about the other person, and it's always undeserved. See, David teaches us this. Compassion is more than reacting, you know, to what we see. Like, compassion actually seeks out needs. Like, we go, oh, you know, when I see it, I'll do it. Well, you know what? Compassion goes beyond that. Like, it looks for opportunities. I think about a man who's on an elevator in a hospital. He's on the top floor. He gets to the next level. And here comes a, a young woman in a wheelchair being wheeled in by a nurse. And she's holding a baby. And there's the husband, the dad. And there's the older sister. She's like four years old. And everyone's oohing and on over the baby. The next floor, the door opens. And here comes an overweight lady. She comes in, the, she comes in and he noticed that she saw something that no one else noticed. Immediately... She says, oh, you have a baby. You're going home with a baby. He's like, yeah. And then she immediately turned her attention from the baby to the four-year-old daughter who was in the corner. 
And she says, you know, it must be really, it must be really important for you to be here because you're here on the day that your little brother is going home from the hospital. Your parents must think a lot of you. You, you are going to be an amazing older sister. And as they got off the elevator, he started recalling that, that she noticed someone who felt left out. She took time to speak compassionate word of encouragement to someone that no one else noticed in the elevator. And he wrote these words. I couldn't help but think that maybe the lady's overweight condition made her more sensitive to people who sometimes are overlooked, sometimes brushed aside. So the question is, when you walk in the room, do you go after the more popular people or do you look for people who are on the edges, who are being left out and try to bring them into the circle? See, compassion is looking for needs that often other people will overlook. Here's the thing about growing in Christ. If you grow in Christ, you're gonna grow in compassion. You ought to be more compassionate today than you were five years ago if you're growing in Christ. If you cannot sense in your life a growing ability to spot people who have needs, a growing desire to respond to those needs with action, you are not growing in Christ. You are spiritually nearsighted. As Peter says, you are blind. You're blind to everything except what you want, and you think only about yourself. So we need to grow in our compassion on this mission with Jesus and with one another. And number two, as we close, compassion is more than giving money. It's building relationships. Notice that David didn't just send Mephibosheth money. David says, you know what? I'm going to treat you like family. You're one of my boys. You're in my family now. You sit at my table always. I don't know a compassionate person who's not a giver. Compassionate people are always givers. But then they take the next step. The compassion person always notices this, that it's not just giving, it's getting involved personally. You get involved personally in their lives because most of the time relationships need more than possessions. I think about a couple in Montgomery, Alabama who were struggling to have kids. Down in LA, what we call it, which means lower Alabama, there's a young girl who's lost both her mom and her dad. Mom died, we think of leukemia. The dad died just before that by suicide. And this little girl needs a home. And this couple in Montgomery could have just sent money, but they didn't. They adopted. They adopted that little girl. And that little girl is my grandma. Here's a photo, just two days ago, just two days ago, my grandparents are still alive and they watch us every, every week and my, my grandmother's over there on the right side and she was that little girl. And people could have just sent money, but they took the next level of compassion and they got personally involved. And just like David did with Mephibosheth, you come and you sit at my table. You come and you're part of my family. And I wanna tell you right now, that compassion with action not only changed that little girl's life, but it changed the next generation, and it changed the next generation, and it changed the next generation, all because Jesus' followers said, you know what, God's been so good to me, and I want, to, I want that compassion to go on beyond, long after I'm dead and gone. I'm so grateful for my great-grandparents I wouldn't be here without them. My kids wouldn't know Jesus without them. Compassion changes lives. Amen. Will you, will you stand with me? John 13, 35, we start off with it. Let's end with it. These are the words of Jesus. This is who we are. This is our mission, church, as we launch into 2023. Will you say them with me? Will you say them? Will you read them with me like lions? Here we go. One, two, three. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Let me pray over you right now. Father God, we come before you. And just like Mephibosheth, God, we have fallen. We have been paralyzed by sin. And God, many of us, if we're honest, like Mephibosheth, Lord, we've been hiding. Lord, we've been hiding because of fear and guilt and shame. But God, you sent a king. Lord, we talked about King David. You sent a different king, the king of all kings, Jesus. And Jesus came and he knocked on our door. 
And he didn't sit and throw us money. He died for us because he wants us to sit at his table always until the end of time. So, Lord, I thank you so much for sending us a king who shows us what compassion looks like. And, Lord, may we not just receive that compassion, but, Lord, may that compassion flow out of us to all people, even people who harm us and hurt us, people who ignore us. Lord, may we be a force of joy and light and compassion in this dark, dark world. And may you get all the glory. And, Lord, when you do these acts of compassion, Lord, it changes lives. It changes generations. And people will be in eternity. They will be with us in heaven because of it. Lord, thank you so much for using us because you bless us so, so much. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. The whole church said, amen. If there's a way it can be a blessing to you, or we have a prayer team up here, we'd love to pray for you. Maybe today you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Can we give God the glory right now? Just give him praise for being so compassionate. Why don't you come right now as we sing about the way maker.
remind you, Welcome RCC is happening uh, next week, and we'd love to have you there. And uh, Anthony will be do- leading that, so they'll be starting at 10 o'clock. So that's happening next Sunday. If you've never done that, go ahead and make that move. Welcome RCC next week. So go to 8.30 or 11.30 service next week. Be there at 10. And Women's Bible Study, they're launching that on January 12th, but registration launches today. Find information about it in the bulletin, and ladies, it's going to be amazing starting on Thursday, January 12th. Can we give God, the God of compassion, one last praise right now before we leave? He deserves the church, and let's go be a voice and a source of light in the world of compassion. Go be a blessing. Love you guys. Happy New Year.